Now, I was also thinking about advertising. Uh, my major in college was in communications. It was rhetoric and political culture, studied the art of persuasion, and took some advertising classes. And when you think about businesses and companies and products that we consume, there's like this chain, right, of partnership. There's all these different departments that get you the stuff that you purchase. And part of that is advertising. And how many of you knew that advertisers are actually in the manufacturing business? And what are they manufacturing? Need. Advertisers manufacture need. Their job is to make you and I feel like you need what they have to sell. I am 100% convinced that I need to save money by switching to Geico. Like 100%. That's how effective they are. I just feel like I need that. I need, my wife is watching, I need a Tesla. <laughs> it's not going to happen. Like, I can't afford it. I wouldn't do it. The elders would probably fire me. But anyway, um, that, that's what they do. They manufacture need. And so we are bombarded in our culture, right, from outside with these needs, these things, right, that, that people are saying we need, but we're also bombarded from inside because there's these things that we need or we feel like we need. But what if I told you that there was one thing you needed more than anything else? That if you had this one thing, it would change everything. I think that's what we see here in the 23rd Psalm. It's one of the most well-known and beloved passages in the entire Bible. It's written by David, who we've been reading about in our Bible reading plan in 1 and 2 Samuel. And we don't know specifically when or in what situation David wrote it. Maybe David wrote it when he was a political refugee and had to flee from King Saul. Remember that story? Maybe he wrote it later as an older man after he had been king of Israel. Whenever he wrote it, this psalm expresses a seasoned relationship with God that has weathered the storms of life. And so I want to have us read this psalm out loud together. I'm gonna, we're going to be reading in the English Standard Version. So if you, if you memorized KJV growing up, it's not going to help you right now. So you just read with us on the screen here, all of our campuses, those of you watching. Let's read the 23rd Psalm out loud together. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. This is God's word. Verse 1, he says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. And that's basically the the topic sentence of this psalm. And here's what he's saying. He's saying basically, because the Lord is my shepherd, because I have this intimate relationship with God, I have everything I need. He's saying, my shepherd will not withhold anything I need in order to enjoy the abundant life that he has made possible for me to live. And the rest of the psalm basically expounds on and illustrates verse 1. And we know, right, you might remember David was a shepherd as a young boy. But when we think of shepherds, we don't really think of anything or anybody special. But throughout the Old Testament, shepherd is often used as a royal title. That's why the kings of Israel are often called, are described as shepherds. And that's why God himself is described as a shepherd throughout the Old Testament. Listen to Isaiah f chapter 40, verses 10 and 11. Isaiah says, Behold... The Lord God comes with might, and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. Listen, he will tend his flock like a shepherd. 
He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those who are with young. See, God is a king, but this king leads like a shepherd, not like a tyrant. So in a sense, through his own personal testimony, David is answering the question, what is it like to live under the authority of God? What is it like to live in covenant relationship with Yahweh? He's the Lord. He has all power. No one and nothing can thwart his will. He has absolute unrivaled authority over everything in the universe, which would be terrifying if we were just talking about a human king or a human president. If we were just talking about a, a, a sinful or, or, or selfish king, but this king is the king of kings. And he's the Lord of lords. And listen, and he is good. Amen. He is gracious. He will exercise his power and authority for the good benefit of his people. And as we've been reading through the Old Testament so far, we've seen God leading his people just like this, liberating them from oppression in Egypt, caring for them in the wilderness, protecting them from enemy armies. But listen, what makes this psalm, this particular psalm so breathtaking is, is that David here is not just saying the Lord is a shepherd or, or the shepherd. David says with full confidence and overflowing joy, the Lord is what? My shepherd. He uses very personal language all throughout this song. He leads me. He restores my soul. As I reflected on this psalm and prayed about what God wants to say to us through it, this idea kind of kept coming to my mind. Remember I said, what if I told you that, that you need one thing more than you need anything else, that if you had this one thing, it would change everything. And you might be tempted to give me the Sunday school answer. You might be tempted to say, yeah, that one thing is God, and you would be correct. But I want to press beyond that. Because I think what God says to us in Psalm 23 and throughout the rest of the Bible is that you just, you don't just need God. That's not just the, the one thing you need. You don't just need God. You need intimacy with God. Amen. You need an intimate relationship with God. That's the thought that kept coming to my mind as I was reading this psalm. I need intimacy with God more than I need anything else. You might remember at the beginning of the year, beginning of 2019 in January, David preached a message and he kind of kicked off uh, just a time of, of prayer. He was preaching about prayer and fasting and he said this. He said, the most important thing in your world is not your family, not your husband, not your wife, not your kids, not your job, not your finances, not your health. He said, the most important thing in the world is your personal relationship, your personal intimacy with God. It's true. It's true. And so listen, listen. David isn't just declaring truths about God. David is describing his personal experience with God. This day by day, situation by situation, season by season, personal intimacy with God. And here's why this is so important. This is why this is so important for you. Listen, if you're not a Christian and you're exploring Christianity, if you are a Christian, this is so important because, listen, if you're a follower of Jesus, wherever God has you or wherever God calls you, it is your intimacy with him that will ultimately satisfy and sustain you. Amen. And this is good news because no matter what happens, nobody can take that from you. Is this not the witness, the testimony that we see throughout church history when we read about brothers and sisters in Christ who have been persecuted in different parts of the world and yet they have this deep well of joy even in prison. Even when they're standing literally at, at their death, there's this intimacy with God they have even in that moment. And so David describes four benefits almost that he experiences as he walks in intimacy with God. Here's the first one. As we walk in intimacy with God, God will restore us. He will restore us. Look at verse 2. He says, he makes me lie down in green pastures. 
he leads me beside still waters. This picture of a shepherd leading his sheep. And, and you think about the conditions of ancient Israel during that time, or even if you visit it today, it can be super hot, it can be dry. The terrain is kind of these rocky hills. It's not easy. And so this is a picture of respite and recuperation for the sheep who, who have, have been wearied on this, on this journey. And, and that's why David takes the shepherding analogy and then he applies it to his soul. He says, just like a shepherd provides that kind of respite and recuperation to his sheep, God, my king, my shepherd, restores my soul. Some people would say David is basically talking about forgiveness or the work of God drawing us to repentance. And it's true that when we stray into disobedience, God will draw us into repentance. We see that in Jesus' parable in Luke 15. This, 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 this story, right, of a, of a shepherd who leaves the 99 who are still in the flock to go after and pursue the one who strayed away. But that's not the picture David is painting here. This is a picture not of God rescuing wayward sheep, but of God ref refreshing and replenishing weary sheep. You see, listen, the gospel is not just good news about our sinfulness. The gospel is also good news about our weariness. Let me ask you, have you ever been emotionally or spiritually drained? Like you felt completely depleted. Like your capacity for joy was spent. The inner strength you needed to trust God, it was done. You were on E. You had nothing left to give. And maybe you came here, one of our campuses, or you're listening to this message, and you feel like that right now. Listen, let's be honest. Sometimes life wears you down. If we're sometimes following Jesus, wears you down. The overwhelming stress and strain of work or a, a frustrating job environment, the sleepless nights and nonstop needs of, of young children, the emotional weariness that sets in when you've been battling a struggle that seems like it will never end, a difficult or, or hurtful relationship. Maybe it's a health challenge. A lot of people don't know this, but my wife, so we started dating in, in college, and ever since college, my wife has, like literally, like up to this Friday night, my wife has, has had these sudden, unbearable cold chills. They just come out of nowhere, and I've never in my life seen somebody in more anguish than in those moments. And listen, when they come, when it happens, everything shuts down. I, I'm gra grabbing blankets. I'm trying to get, get uh, fleeces, whatever, sometimes literally covering her myself just so my body, he can somehow like, like regulate her, her temperature. And we can't figure out why. We can't figure out why. And listen, she would say even with that, she would say the physical pain is bad but the emotional toll may be even worse. The way the experience it, itself or the fear of the next one wears down her soul. Listen, all of us hit seasons and situations in life that leave our souls weary and wounded, drained. And before we even move forward, the first thing I want to say is we have to get over the shame of feeling that way, of admitting that that's where we are. I'm speaking to everybody, especially men. We have to get over the shame and the pride that keeps us from saying, I'm spent. I'm done, like my soul is weary. I don't have anything, I don't have any more. I can't, I, I can't, I don't have it in me to trust God right now. I don't, I don't, I don't know, I don't, I'm done. We have to be able to get to a point where we can be completely honest that we are spent and use that to turn 
to God. I remember I took my kids for a walk one day last summer. It was blazing hot, and I'm, I'm lying to you now. I'm dead serious. Before we even got out the driveway, they were thirsty. <laughs> we didn't make it down the block, and they are acting like they just have, are, are just, I, it was just crazy. And, and, and listen, they could look at me in one of two ways in that moment. They could look at me and think to themselves, listen, what kind of parent are you? But you brought us out here in this heat. They could look at us and, and think, how could you be good and let us come out here and get this thirsty? You trying to kill us? See, this is why mom has always been my favorite parent. Like, they could think that. They wouldn't say that. But they could look at me and they think that. Or they could look at me and they could say, Dad, I'm thirsty. And that's all they would have to say. Dad, I'm thirsty. This was a pro dad day. I had already threw some water bottles down in Jackson's. You know what? I, I was killing it this day. This was only one day. It doesn't always happen that way. But I had already prepared what they needed in order for them to be refreshed. Listen, sometimes God will call you to do things that drain you. That he knows will drain you. But God promises to be the one who will replenish you, who will restore your soul. David knew that, and in difficult times, he asks for that. Psalm 119, 25, he says, my soul clings to the dust. Revive me according to your word. And listen, I'm not just saying when we're weary or when we're burdened, all we need is a devotional time. Yeah, we do. We do need a devotional time. We do need to sit with God in prayer in his word. God refreshes us and restores us in that way. But sometimes you, you need some sleep. Sometimes you need a counselor. Sometimes you need to laugh or watch a good movie or get out and enjoy the beauty of nature. But here's the difference. When you're walking in intimacy with God and when you're viewing life through the lens of God's word, you receive those very practical physical blessings as good gifts from your shepherd, from your heavenly father. The God that knows how we're wired and he knows exactly what we need in order to replenish our souls. And so Jesus himself says in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, he says, come to me. All you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. As we walk in intimacy with God, God will restore us. Number two, as we walk in intimacy with God, he will guide us. He says in verse three, he says, he leads me in paths of righteousness. You could also translate this, he leads me in right paths. The paths that are right. And so there's a moral dimension to this that God's guidance will always align with his will. No matter what we think or what we feel or what the people around us claim, God will never lead us to violate his word. So listen, listen. If you feel led to do something or believe something that violates scripture, you are not being led by God. You're being led by someone else or something else. You're not being led by God. God will lead you in right paths, righteous paths. But even outside black and white, right or wrong issues, God guides us when we just need wisdom. He, he promises that through James in James 2.5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously without reproach, without finding fault, and it will be given to him. Listen, God wants to guide you. God does not delight in you being confused. He wants to guide you whether you're trying to figure out which job offer to take or who to date or which kids a school uh, your, your, ki uh, your kids should go to, whatever, whenever you're not sure what to do, you can seek his guidance through prayer and scripture and godly advice, and he will show you the best path to take. So this gives us confidence that God wants to and will lead us in right paths. But I think this also means, listen, that the paths God leads us on are the right paths. 
In, in other words, we can have confidence that God is at work on the path that he has me on right now. God is guiding me through his providence. God's providence just means God is at work through the circumstances of life. God will guide you. In fact, God is guiding you. I can see God's guidance in my own life. Remember after after college, so my wife and I were, were, were dating uh, in college, and then I graduated before, before she did, not long after, because I was in college for a really long time, but that's a whole other story. And uh, so, uh, so right after college, my first job was in ministry. I worked for an evangelist named Luis Palau. And so we, that's actually how I end up even hearing about McLean Bible Church. And so, uh, so I was working here in D.C., and then they asked me to move to Orlando to, to do some work with the Luis Palau team in Orlando. And so I have a decision to make. Do I move to Florida? Do I stay here? Me and my wife are dating. Are we going to date long distance? Which is a whole other sermon. And so we have to edit those notes first. And so, so, so what do I do? So I decide. Just I'll get godly advice. I'm reading scripture. I'm praying. I decide just based on just wisdom it seems. God opened that door. Cool. I'm moving to Florida. The night before I'm moving, matter of fact, the morning, I'm like 2 o'clock in the morning. I'm leaving to drive to Florida at like 4 o'clock in the morning. And I'm cleaning my room. I'm packing everything. And underneath my bed, I find this dusty shoebox. I open the shoebox. I'm going through it. It had a bunch of stuff like memory type stuff in it. It was a little folded up sheet of paper. I open the sheet of paper. You know what was on the paper? Let me tell you. Rewind a little bit. As a college student, Dating my wife, the first time we ever hung out. We were coming down to D.C. to visit the monuments and stuff. It was me, my wife, and our friend Mary, who's actually at our Montgomery County campus right now. The three of us were going to camp, hang, hang out. I picked them up from, from campus. They hop in a car. Mary says, yo, I had a dream last night. Mike, I had a dream that you moved to Florida. Because we were college students. I wrote that dream down. Years later, that's the dream that was on a little piece of paper in the shoebox underneath my bed. Now, you might think to yourself, well, that was just coincidence. Okay, cool. Why did I even write the dream down? And why did I never read it again until the night before I'm moving to Florida? Maybe it's coincidence or maybe it's God establishing my steps. Maybe it's God confirming his guidance in my life that, that, son, I've been at work in your life before you even knew you had a decision to make. Amen. And listen, listen, that doesn't even end the story. Like, don't even clap there yet because so I, I moved to Florida. I'm living in Orlando. I have another decision to make at, at, at that point. So I, I'm, I'm moving to Orlando. I moved to Tampa. I'm living in Florida. While I'm living in, in Florida, McLean Bible Church invites me to come here to preach. I had only preached two sermons in my entire life. I was like 24. That was not a wise decision on the part of Lon Solomon or the elders. But So I came. I stood right here. I preached my first sermon in this church right here. And you know what my first sermon was about? It was about God's guidance, about how God led Moses and the children of Israel out of Egypt. And instead of him, them, uh, him taking them the shorter route, which was northeast to the promised land, he took them south through the wilderness to Mount Sinai, all the way around up and up to the promised land. Why would he do that? And you know what the personal application was? I shared like... I feel like God called me and wired me to reach emerging generations in the D.C. area. And honestly, I don't know why God has me in Florida right now. How could I ever have known that 14 years later, I would be standing in that same spot after having been a pastor in this church for 12 years? How could I have known that? I didn't know that, but God did. Amen. God knew that. He was guiding me the whole time. I just had to follow him one step at a time. Let me ask you something. How has God guided you to this point? 
when you look back over the course of your life, if you are really a child of God and a follower of Jesus, can't you say, even if you're in difficulty right now, God has been faithful. God, I've seen his hand at work in my life at different points. And listen, why does he guide us? David says it right here. He leads me in paths of righteousness. Why? For his name's sake. For his name's sake. When I was growing up, some of the older women, like in our family or whatever, like they would look at a kid, and sometimes it was us, you know, with their hair not right or kids, whatever, and they would say, you, they're over here looking like a motherless child. <laughs> it wasn't really a nice thing to say. But what they, were, what they were acknowledging, what they were acknowledging is a very good point, that a child's well-being is ultimately the responsibility of and a reflection on that child's parent. Listen, God does not want us running around looking like fatherless kids. Listen, God has tied, when it says he leads us for his name's sake, it means God has tied his reputation to the well-being of his people. He guides us because he wants what's good and what's best for us, but he also wants to demonstrate and display his goodness and his wisdom and his graciousness to us and through us. And so listen, God's guidance will always lead us on paths that bring him glory and ultimately bring us good. And the reason I stress ultimately is because sometimes God guides us through bad situations. That's number three, as we walk in intimacy with God, even in some dark times, God will reassure us. He will reassure us. We see it in verse four. He says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Remember I said that the paths God leads us on are the right paths. Paths, but here's the problem the paths that God leads us on aren't always the paths that we would have chosen for ourselves. In fact, sometimes we find ourselves in dark and difficult circumstances, and if we're not careful, we wonder where is God? I'm sure the Apostle Paul sometimes felt that way about the thorn in his side. And the problem is this that we often equate God's goodness and presence with verses one through three. God is leading him on paths of righteousness, even through the valley of the shadow of death. He's still leading. A few weeks ago, my wife and I got to hang out with some friends, and we met a young couple. This young, just vibrant, godly young couple. I mean, literally, this was like three weeks ago. I just saw a social media post this week that the wife posted. It was a picture of a curtain, the kind, of, the kind of like the privacy curtain that the nurse will pull at, at a hospital. And this is what she wrote. She said, two and a half weeks ago, I sat behind this curtain after a routine mammogram. So that was like half of a week, a few days after we met her. She said, I... I sat behind this curtain waiting for the radiologist to tell me if more imaging would be needed. I snapped this picture because I thought it would be a moment I would need to remember. Though it took about a week for the doctors to confirm it, after the first mention of a biopsy, I knew that I had cancer. Though there are some remaining tests, the doctors have currently classified it as stage 1A invasive carcinoma. Some of us know what that feels like. whether it's a devastating diagnosis or a devastating circumstance that takes the wind out of you. That is not the path, not the situation, not the circumstance that you would have chosen for yourself. But here's the very next thing she wrote. She said, the Lord has given me so much peace and grace to trust in him and his goodness with this diagnosis. I know that this is no surprise to him and that he works all things together for our 
good. Listen, this is why I say you need intimacy with God more than you need anything else. Because you cannot have that kind of reassurance, that kind of, of joyful confidence in God's goodness if you're not walking in close intimacy with him. And that's what David experiences. I'm walking through the valley of the shadow of death. We don't know the situation, fleeing from, so we don't know what exactly he was talking about. But he says, even in the midst of that, I will fear no evil. Why? Because God, you are with me. You're with me. The shepherds, right, they would lead their sheep to grass and water, but they often led them literally through these ravines or these deep, dark valleys. And if a flash flood hit, they could be wiped out. In the, in the darkness of these ravines, predators would just lay in wait to tear these sheep apart. And David says, that's kind of what it, this season of life feels like, but I still fear no evil. And it's not just that he knows God is with him. It's that he experiences God's reassuring presence in the midst of it. He says, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The shepherd's rod was used for protection, to, to fend off the predators. And, and hear me, listen, if you're exploring Christianity, if, if you got questions, you got to understand this. It is not that God protects us from ever experiencing bad things. Jesus was clear. He says, in this life, you will have trouble. Listen, this is not fine print in the Bible. This is not the dude talking real fast at the end of the pharmaceutical commercial. Take this, but you might die. This is not, this is not that, no. God, Jesus is not trying to like slip this past you. He says this up front, in this life, you will have trouble. Christianity is not naive or misleading. Being a Christian, even a really good Christian, does not exempt you from trouble. But God is still in control when trouble comes. And his promise is that our problems will never thwart his purposes. Ever. Int Listen, intimacy with God doesn't keep you from experiencing the difficulties of life, but it changes how you experience the difficulties of life. And so the shepherd's rod was used for protection, but the shepherd's staff was used for correction. It was a long stick with a hook on the end, and he used it to pull back sheep that were drifting into danger. So listen, the good shepherd protects the sheep from others, but the good shepherd also protects the sheep from themselves. The good shepherd is saying, no, you're a part of my flock. I've taken full responsibility for you. I'm not just going to sit back and watch you drift off a cliff. And this is what God does for us when we drift into sin or a pattern of unwise choices. When God sees us drifting into danger because he loves us, he corrects us or disciplines us. In other words, when David says, your rod and your staff come for me, is this picture of a shepherd who will do whatever is necessary to keep you on the right path. Whatever is necessary to keep you in position for him to accomplish his purposes in your life. God will reassure you of his presence even in the valley, he will reassure you that he has not abandoned you, that he has not given up on you, that the work he has begun in you, he will bring it to completion. Amen. He'll bring it to completion in any and every situation and season of life. And listen, this is why this psalm has been so comforting and reassuring to elderly believers throughout Christian history. Listen, this is a sidebar. Listen, to the younger people in our church... Teenagers, young adults, young couples. This is part of why it's so important for us to build meaningful relationships with some older saints in the body of Christ because we need to not just read these things, we need to be able to watch this stuff in real time, to watch some older men and women who have been through some stuff and are going through some things and maybe literally be on their deathbed and watch the sweet, reassuring intimacy that they have in their relationship with God. We praise God for the long witness of those older believers in our church. 
God will <clears throat> reassure us. My wife and I were on a flight, and uh, uh, actually this weekend, we just got back last night, and then we hit a little bit of a, a turbulence, and, um, and, and I... Uh, I, I didn't show it. I was a little nervous. You know what I mean? Um, I just, I'm, I'm not going to show it. Uh, and so uh, it's like the plane is like shaking a little bit. And, and, uh, and so I'm, start, I'm, I'm praying, you know, uh, Lord, provide some foster and adopt parents for my kids or <laughs> whatever, you know. Um, and, uh, and, but then it dawned on me. The flight attendants were chilling. Like, in fact, like, they still, they, the, 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 the snack trays are still, like, mobile. I mean, they are, they are delightfully passing out pretzels and all of that. And I want that joint, like, are they aware that we all about to die? Like, how? <laughs> and they're chilling. Listen, and, and it, I just, it just dawned on me. Listen, if they're not nervous, listen, they know turbulence better than I do. And so if I really want to know how things are going, I'm not, I shouldn't look out the window. I should look at them. I should listen for the voice of the pilot. It is the same thing in your relationship with God. God is not nervous. Amen. Nothing that comes into your life is a surprise. He is still sovereign and in control. And he will reassure you sometimes by moving and changing the situation but every time, if you're a child of God, by reminding you and allowing you to experience his reassuring presence. As we walk in intimacy with God, he will reassure us. Here's the last point. As we walk in intimacy with God, he will provide for us. He'll provide for us. It's full circle now. He says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Here's a picture of God's provision. Verse 5, he says, you prepare. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. And some scholars argue that David is still continuing the shepherding theme here, that the table refers to a table land, like this plush plain, right, that, that the shepherd leads his, his sheep to and that, that the, the oil is, is either like medicine, right, to, to address their scratches and wounds or the oil would have served as kind of like a bug spray that they, they would put on their head to, to keep away parasites and pests. And listen, if that's true, <coughs> it's a beautiful picture and it flows well with the first half of the psalm. Days or weeks before, the shepherd would have scouted out this table land, he would have made this preparation in, in, in that way. Most Bible scholars, though, think David is switching analogies at this point to God being like someone hosting a feast or a banquet in their home. And that seems to make sense, too, since David continues that thought in verse 6 when he says, I shall dwell in the house of the Lord for." Forever. Really, both of them are communicating the same point, that the shepherd prepares for us, even in the presence of threats, even in the presence of enemies. And listen, meditating on that word prepare has been such a blessing to me this week. I'll be completely honest. So I had like we in First and Second Samuel and Psalms in our Bible reading plan so they, I could have preached anything. Part of the reason I preach this is just because God has been using this so much in my life this week. And so I've been thinking about that word, prepare. That, that, that the thought that God has made preparation for me. You think about a Michelin like star chef just preparing this, this, not just a meal, but a dining experience for you. Every detail impeccably designed, every ingredient specifically selected for, for you. I remember being at this like really fancy white tablecloth kind of restaurant when I was a little bit younger. I was with my, my whole family, and I'm a little more cultured now, you know, but back then, like, you know, I was on, like, college student budget, you know what I mean? And so, but I remember going with them, and I remember after the appetizer, they brought all of us, like, some bowls of sorbet. Now, first of all, I don't know the difference between sorbet and sherbet. For me, sherbet was the climax of the birthday party, the little tub you get at Giant, right? Rainbow sherbet. I, I didn't know, and so my thought is, like, listen, I know dinner is not over. I know. I know that little goat cheese drop we had for appetizer was not the whole meal. Why are they bringing us dessert? <laughs> Thankfully, it had somebody in my family kind of whisper in my ear, no, 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 no. They bring you this to cleanse your palate. 
Don't act like some of y'all ain't, like you have known that your whole life. <laughs> they, they bring you sorbet to like cleanse your palate. I'm like, man, this is, this whole restaurant is out of my league. This is, this is crazy. But when you really think about it, when you think about the fact that that restaurant, that chef, that, that staff has prepared all of this for you. Literally, they have prepared a way for you to wash your taste buds so that you could fully enjoy all the flavors of the rest of the meal. It was a seven-course meal. We'd only finished the first course. Listen, God himself, God himself has prepared for you. He has made preparation for you, exquisite preparation, that this, this picture, not just of, of a table, but this lavish feast and the anointing oil, which was like ancient hospitality, not like in our kind of American culture, like there's still some cultures in the world where hospitality is like a high value, like to not be hospitable is like blasphemy, it's, it's, it's sin, don't be coming over my house and, and I don't have no food ready and I'm not, like that's how it was in this ancient culture, hospitality was major and so you would come in and, and there was preparation that was made for you in advance, or if you just showed up and knocked on the door, they would stop everything and prepare for you. And so you needed to freshen up from a weary journey, then they would anoint your head with oil. It's almost like perfume, kind of freshening you up a little bit. And the cup on the table, like the cup, is not just giving you like a little drop just to quench your thirst. No, the cup is overflowing. He's keeping the party going. Every time it looks like your cup is going to hit the bottom, like God, the good shepherd, is filling it back up. This picture of God's overwhelming, overflowing grace and generosity that flows from his nature and character as a good and gracious God. Listen, wherever God leads us, he has already made provision for us. Think about, listen, you need... You need you need to hear that. You need to trust that. God has already made provision for you. I think about Nate and Kristen Crew about to plant a church this fall. I think about a couple at our MoCo campus that heard the call to missions is in, is in the process right now of selling their house and moving their young family to Southeast Asia this summer. Listen, you may not know the future. You may not be able to foresee all the challenges, but here's what you can know with 100%. God has already made provision for you. Listen, man, like if you make the choice, if you make the commitment, sincere commitment, God, I'm going to follow you. It doesn't matter what you call me to do. It doesn't matter what you tell me to do. You have a 100% guarantee because God, the good shepherd, has taken full responsibility for your life. You have the 100% guarantee that whatever God calls you to, he has already made provision for you. He has already prepared everything that you need in order to live the abundant life that he's made possible for you to live. He has taken personal responsibility for everything you need. And not just for tomorrow or for the next season of your life, but forever. Verse 6, surely goodness and mercy, the kindness of God and the covenant steadfast love of God shall follow me all the days of my life and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Listen, whenever you show up to a situation, you show up with an entourage. A shepherd in front of you, goodness and mercy behind you. In any situation and season you walk into, even death. Goodness and mercy will follow you, will pursue you on the other side of the grave if you're in Christ every day of your life and you will dwell in the house of the Lord, the presence of God forever. Listen, this is the gospel. It's the gospel. It's the gospel that Jesus is our good shepherd who also personally experienced our lives as sheep. 
that he knows what it's like to be weary and burdened. He had to pull away and be replenished in the presence of his father. Read the gospels that he humbled himself in submission to the father's guidance to the point that John 17, 19 says, he, Jesus, could do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his father doing. When he was in the garden, he experienced the reassurance of his heavenly father. When he's there, like in the valley of the shadow of death, he sees, he knows the cross is coming. And he knows what he's going to go through physically. And he knows what he's going to go through spiritually in separation from the Father as he takes the wrath that we deserve. And he says, God, if there's any way for this cup to pass, if there's any way for you to helicopter drop in and pluck me out of the valley of the shadow of death, please do it. And something happens in that moment. I think it's just the reassuring presence of his Father. And he shifts and he says, not my will but your will be done. Amen. I know this isn't going to be a pleasant, but I have all the reassurance I need that although it's not pleasant, it's also not permanent. Amen. It's also not permanent because in the presence of his enemies, when his enemies were spitting on him and mocking him and beating him and tortured him, and executed him on the cross in the presence of his enemy, death, in the presence of his enemy, Satan. Did not God provide? He didn't just provide like a meal. Like he rose Jesus from the grave and he provided to him the name that is above every name. Imagine Satan's surprise when Jesus got up. When Jesus watches him now honored, as the risen Lord, as he watches us through our singing and through our living, honor Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And so listen, listen, Jesus, the risen Lord, wants to be your shepherd. All right, as we close, listen to John 10. Jesus says this, he says this to you, he says this to me. He says, the thief Satan comes to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And listen, and I lay my life down for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold, people of every nation, tribe, and tongue. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice, so there will be one flock, one shepherd. Listen, Jesus has made a way for you to join the flock of God. He's made a way for you to join the family of God. You say, how do I do it? By listening to his voice. By hearing him through the message of the gospel say to you, you are wayward. You, you, have, you have drifted off the path in your sin. And it's worn you out. You are weary. You are lost. You are in danger. You are empty. And Jesus says, I came and I lived the perfectly righteous life that you couldn't. And I died in your place on the cross. And I rose from the grave in order to be your shepherd. In order to be that king that every day for the rest of your life demonstrates and reveals my goodness to you and, and through you. And so listen, if you're here and you're not a follower of Jesus, you're not a Christian, this is for you. With all your questions and doubts and all of that, here at our campuses, this is for you. That Jesus wants to be your shepherd. And all you have to do, you don't need me, you don't need a priest. All you need is the voice of the Lord Jesus saying to you, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Amen. So even as we close in prayer, right now where you're sitting, you could say to him, I know I'm wayward in my sin. I want to turn from my sin. And Lord Jesus, I want to completely trust in you that you paid the penalty for my sin. And I want to invite you. To not just be my savior, but to be my Lord, my leader, my shepherd. And maybe you're here and there's some other things you need to say to God. And so I want to give you, before I close in prayer, I want to give you and all of us gathered at our campuses, I want to give you an opportunity between you and God. And I just want to give you an opportunity to pray as we close.
And I just want you to pick one of these benefits, one of these promises. I think we'll put them up on screen. But listen, God, I need your restoration. I need your guidance. I need your reassurance. I need your provision. Or maybe you need to pray, God, I want you, I need you to become my shepherd. Take a minute between you and the Lord and just pour your heart out. Be honest with him and then I'll close us in prayer. Well, Father, we thank you. We thank you so much for your goodness and your grace, your wisdom and power and strength that you make available to us. And Father, I think the only appropriate response, the most concise, accurate thing I know to say in response to this psalm is, God, I need you. We need you. I need you, God. And you know how I've prayed for the people listening to this message. God, would you persuade them deep in their souls that they need you too. In your mercy, and your grace, Lord, would you allow them to experience life under your leadership and your care. I pray all this in the name of the good shepherd, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.